that good may come of it. That there are devils and witches, the scripture asserts and experience confirms. That they are the common enemies of mankind and set upon mischief is not to be doubted. That the devil can, by divine permission, and often doth vex man in both body and estate without the instrumentality of witches is undeniable. That he often hath and delights to have the concurrence of witches and their consent in harming man is consonant to his native malice to man. That witches, when detected and convinced, should be exterminated, cut off. We have God's warrant for. In the book of Exodus, the 22nd chapter, verse 18, only the same God who hath said, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, hath also said, At the mouth of two witnesses shall he that is deserving of death be put to death. At the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. So, I, Increase Mather, president of the Harvard College at Cambridge, write in Cases of Conscience Concerning Evil Spirits, with a hearty request to God that he discover the depths of this hellish design. It'll be hereby set into the code of laws governing Connecticut and New Haven colonies this year, 1650. If any man or woman be a witch, that is, hath consultation with a familiar spirit, they shall be put to death. In the year 1663, a Farmington woman was executed for witchcraft. Her name was Mary Barnes, and she lived with her husband, Thomas, and their four children out on Main Street here in Farmington. This is her story, and the story of people of 17th century Connecticut. How they lived, how they thought about themselves, and what the world looked like to them and felt like to them. Farmington was first known as Tunxus Plantation, named by the English Puritans from Hartford, who settled the area in 1639. The young village was primitive, with muddy streets lined by one-story, unpainted wooden houses. In the center of town stood the Puritan Meeting House, emblematic of the dominant role religion played in the community's life. A square, unpainted log building, the Meeting House was the site for almost daily service, each lasting several hours. On the bare soil in front of the building were the stocks and the whipping post, used for public punishment and humiliation of residents who broke the strict laws of church and community. The New England witchcraft trials were a reflection of Puritan religious thought and English law. The strict Calvinist religion required that members live up to the rigid moral code stated in the Bible. Members and non-members of the church were required to follow this code. Despite the fact that two-thirds of the New England population failed to qualify for church membership. The new colonies, however, did not create witchcraft trials. For two centuries prior, those suspected of witchcraft were feared and prosecuted. The great campaigns against witches dovetailed with Europe's brutal religious wars. Even educated people believed that witches were to blame for natural disasters and personal tragedies. The English colonies, as a remote margin of the European world, 
were the last to suffer the wave of the witchcraft penance. And suffer they did. In a strange new land, far away from their familiar homes, and held in place by a church that assumed their unworthiness and offered them no comfort or refuge, the people of Connecticut turned in panic to a ritual they knew all too well when their world spun out of control. And so, the witchcraft panics of Connecticut began. Now our story begins to unfold several years before Mary's trial of 1663. Thomas Barnes came to Hartford in 1635 with just the clothes on his back. Arriving in New England from Essex, England, on a trading ship, he quickly found work building the new city of Hartford, hired by Samuel Willis to build a home on the South Green and clean chimneys and build walls. Thomas was a young man who found himself in the right place at the right time. For his service as a soldier in the Pequot War of 1636, he received land, a six-acre home lot in Hartford, property in Pequot Plantation, now Old Saybrook, and Tux's Plantation, now Farmington. In 1643, he and Mary were wed, and they lived for a while in Hartford before homesteading in Pequot Plantation for several years. Around 1655, they moved permanently to Farmington. In the first 12 years of their marriage, they experienced episodes of turmoil and may have fled to Farmington to escape the experiences of their past. In 1662, traumatic events engulfed them. Hartford and its surrounding sister communities exploded into a witchcraft panic that threatened to destabilize the entire Connecticut colony. Harry Barnes learned that you could not shed your past. Let the people who know Mary Barnes tell you her story. I am Reverend Samuel Hooker. I am the minister of the Church of Tuxus Plantation, so appointed in 1661, following in the footsteps of my father, Reverend Thomas Hooker, the great Puritan minister who founded Hartford. I am leading God's church in a perilous time. We have strict laws in our Puritan colony to assure that people do not follow their natural, depraved ways. It is my duty to punish those who would break God's laws. It is the only way to keep a God-fearing town on the path to righteousness. God has turned his back on us because we have displeased him. Our community is afflicted by witchcraft of multiple kinds. Last year, Elizabeth Kelly, an innocent eight-year-old child, felt stomach pains on a cold day in late March after attending church. Her pain became unbearable, and she cried out that good wife Ayres, a neighbor, was kneeling on her belly and pinching her. For three days, the child was in torment, screaming that Goody Ayres was torturing her. Her friends and family heard her cries, but could do nothing. On the fourth day, she died. An official court of inquest was convened to take depositions against Mrs. Ayres. Goody Ayres and her husband fled the colony before she could be arrested, leaving behind their eight-year-old son and all their lands and possessions. Since that day, all manner of strange occurrences have befallen our community. Anne Cole, a person of real piety and integrity, was taken by a strange fit wherein her tongue was improved by a demon to express ideas which she herself knew nothing of. Sometimes this discourse would go on for quite some time. She named such people who would have mischievous designs against her and others who would afflict her body or spoil her name. She would sometimes speak in a Dutch tone, and therein she told of what had befallen a woman who lived next to a Dutch family in Hartford. 
this poor woman described how her arms were strangely pinched in the night. I've sat by Anne Cole's bedside with my good friend Daniel Willis to transcribe the girl's utterings. She names people as witches. It is my duty to excise these evil people from our community so that we may earn God's blessings back. My name is Ann Cole. I'm 18 years old and I live in the south section of Hartford. I have been experiencing strange fits during which malevolent spirits speak of how they will afflict my body and ruin my marriage, which will soon take place. I have named those people neighbors who live near me and plan me harm. Some of my utterings have been delivered in a Dutch tone dialect. Reverend Samuel Hooker says that the demons make me speak thus to confound my listeners so that they do not hear the truth. I believe him, for I know nothing of the ways of the Dutch or their speech. I, I know there is a Dutch family that lives in Hartford, but I know them not. I know not the ways of the Dutch or their speech. Why would I consort with such people? They say that my fits are so terrible that when I had one in church, a woman fainted. Mr. Samuel Willis invited me to stay with him until I regained my health, and he and Reverend Hooker put to paper my utterances. They say that I have named neighbors as witches, people like Mr. and Mrs. Greensmith. They are distasteful people, and I do not like them. Father said that Mr. Greensmith stole a rake of his last year. Permit me to introduce myself. I am Samuel Willis of Hartford. You will find my home in the south section of Hartford, newly built by my father, the governor. I'm a learned man, schooled in science and religion, and much responsibility falls upon those of us who can see and understand. There is a great evil in this colony, and the devil does tempt people to follow him in sundry ways, and the weak do so without reservation. Now, I've been studying witches for several years now. The New Haven Colony requested my help in rooting out the witchcraft from Pequot Plantation. It was there that I met Mary Barnes and her husband Thomas. They had accused Goodwife Bailey of Pequot Plantation of witchcraft. Now, I was alarmed when I found that the Barnes had moved to Farmington, just down the street from my property. Now, I'm helping Ann Cole by recording what she says during her fits. This evil, <coughs> this evil must be removed from our community. My life will be taken from me. Others have given spectral evidence against me, Elizabeth Seeger. They accuse me of witchcraft. Young Ann Cole utters my name as a witch along with others like Rebecca Greensmith and Judith Varlet. Goodwife Greensmith is already jailed, and she has named others as witches. I have heard she has even accused her own husband and Mary Barnes, late of our town. I'm a righteous woman, God-fearing, suffering God's burden as I give him glory in my daily activities. But the magistrates tell my neighbors to give evidence against me. My neighbors pass me without speaking. Mothers grasp their children so that I won't touch them. But I will be true to God. He will deliver me from this trial. I must now to prayer and my Bible, my solace now. Nicholas Bailey is my name. I moved here from Pequot Plantation a few years ago and uh, began a new life here in Farmington. It has been hard. I was forced from Pequot Plantation by the General Court of New Haven Colony. 
acting on a false accusation of witchcraft by Thomas and Mary Barnes. I left all my land and all our possessions behind. Good wife Barnes testified against my wife, uttering false claims of that to Reverend Hooker and Samuel Willis. Now we shall see if Goodwife Barnes likes being called a witch. She is no friend of mine. <laughs> Mary Barnes did have one friend, a woman named Margaret Jennings. In fact, they shared more than friendship. Both had been accused of serious crimes in their earlier years. Margaret had run off with Nicholas Jennings and had been publicly whipped and forced to marry him. The charge of fornication was extremely serious. But even more serious was a charge of adultery. In fact, it was a capital crime. Mary Barnes was called to the Hartford General Court on a charge of adultery in 1649. Court records do not reveal what transpired from that charge, but it was a serious enough crime to cast a shadow over Mary Barnes for the rest of her life. It may well have been a key factor in the charge of witchcraft. Also key in Mary's vulnerability to a charge of witchcraft was her prior contact with witches in the Bailey case. Increase Mather's singular marker to recognize a witch was prior contact, even as an accuser. Although the Jennings fled and survived, others named by Anne Cole were to suffer the full course of the court's punishment and the community's fury. Rebecca Greensmith. A lewd and ignorant woman, and then in prison on suspicion of witchcraft, mentioned in the discourse as active in the mischiefs done and designed, was by the magistrates sent for. Mr. Whiting and Mr. Haynes read what they had written in the discourse of Anne Cole, and being astonished thereat, Rebecca Greensmith confessed those things to be true and that she and others had had familiarity with the devil. The devil told her that at Christmas time they would have a merry meeting, and then should the covenant between them be subscribed. The next day, she was inquired more particularly concerning her guilt, she acknowledged that when Mr. Haynes began reading the charge against her, her rage was such that she could have torn him to pieces and was resolved as could be to deny her guilt. Yet, as he read further, she was as though the flesh were being pulled from her bones and she could deny no longer. Moreover, she stated that frequently had the devil the carnal knowledge of her body, and that witches held meetings in a place near her house, that some would come in one form and, and some come in another. And one came in the form of a crow and flew amongst them. Upon this confession, with concurrent evidence, the woman was executed. Likewise, also, her husband alongside her. Although he never acknowledged himself guilty. Others named in this preternatural discourse made their escape. Ah, thus, thus doth the devil use to serve his clients. In January 1663, they came for Mary Barnes. On January 6th, she appeared before the particular court in Hartford and was indicted along with Elizabeth Cedar. 
The six men sitting as magistrates were Mr. Allen, Mr. Willis, Mr. Treat, Mr. Wolcott, Mr. Clark, and as secretary, Mr. Joseph Allen. The 12 men on the jury, several of whom owned land in Farmington and certainly knew the Barnes family, were charged with examining the evidence and determining the fates of both women. Elizabeth Seeger, stand forth. Elizabeth Seeger, thou art indicted by the name Elizabeth Seeger, the wife of Richard Seeger, for not having the fear of God before thine eyes. Thou hast entertained familiarity with Satan, ye grand enemy of God and mankind, and by his help has acted things in a preternatural way, beyond the ordinary course of nature, for which according to God's law and ye established laws in this colony, thou deservest to die. How do you plead? I plead not guilty, Your Honor. I refer myself to trial by jury. The jury will decide your guilt or innocence based on the evidence. Are there any here who wish to add evidence against Elizabeth Seeger? Yes. I am Robert Stern of Hartford. I saw Goodwife Seeger in the woods with three more women, and with them I saw two black creatures like two Indians, but taller. I saw likewise a kettle there over a fire. I saw the women dance round three black creatures, and while I looked upon them, one of the women, Goodwife Greensmith, said, look who is a yonder, and then they ran away up the hill. Thank you, Mr. Stern. Are there any others? Mrs. Miggett? Yes. I am Goodwife Miggett of Carver. Goodwife Seeger came to me and told me that God was not, and that it was very good to be with, and desired that I should be one. She said that she did not fear going to the palace, and she would not burn in the fire. She appeared to me that night as an apparition and struck me over and over. Thank you, Mrs. Miggett. Any others? Speak up. Yes. I am Stephen Hart Sr. of Hartford in Farmington. Elizabeth Seeger told me and Josiah Weller that she would send Satan to tell the townspeople that she is not a witch. She also called out in pain when a piece of moldy cheese was thrown into the fire. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Elizabeth Seeger, you are also accused of concealing your friendship with suspected witch, Goody Ayers, and for claiming that the devil would allow you to float during the water test. Are you a God-fearing person, Elizabeth Seeger? I am a God-fearing person. Then you need to give this court a sign that you are guided by the Lord's word and not by the enemy of mankind and God, the grand Satan. Now speak, Elizabeth Seeger, and well, if you wish to remain in this colony and on this earth. Your Honor, you know that only a righteous person can say the Lord's words with conviction. And so I said, from Acts 19, 13 to 16, then there were certain men going from town to town, trying to cast out evil spirits. And they used the Lord Jesus' name in their incantations, saying, come out in the name of Jesus and Paul who preaches him. But one time, the evil spirit said, I know Jesus. And I know Paul, but who are you? Then the evil spirit leapt upon them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the town naked and battered. Jury finds the prisoner not guilty of the indictment. The prisoner is free to go.
Mary Barnes, stand forth. Mary Barnes, thou art here indicted by your name, Mary Barnes, for not having the fear of God before thine eyes. Thou hast entertained familiarity with Satan, ye grand enemy of God and mankind, and by his help has acted things in a preternatural way, beyond the ordinary course of nature, for which according to God's law and ye established laws in this colony, thou deservest to die. How do you plead? I plead not, not guilty, Your Honor, and, and I, I refer myself to a trial by jury. The jury will decide your guilt or innocence based on the evidence. Are there any here who wish to add evidence against Mary Barnes? Mary Barnes has not been accepted for membership into the Farmington Church. Mary Barnes falsely accused my wife of witchery and is herself a witch in doing so. Mary Barnes, I know you well. You escaped capital punishment on the charge of adultery. You accused Goodwife Bailey of Pequot Plantation of witchcraft. Falsely, it seems now. How could you know so much about witchcraft if you yourself were not practicing the black arts? Rebecca Greensmith, a confessed witch, accused you of witchcraft. Are you a God-fearing person? Oh, yes, Your Honor. I am a God-fearing person. Then you need to give this court a sign that you are guided by the Lord's word and not the enemy of mankind and God, the grand Satan. Now, in the case of witchcraft, we know that the devil is the immediate agent in the mischief done. It is the contract and the consent of the witch that is the thing to be demonstrated. And the testimony here shows your contract with the devil is here in all things. Now speak, Mary Barnes. Is there anyone here who will stand and speak for the accused? Very well. Jury finds the prisoner guilty. The prisoner will be taken to Daniel Garrett's to be jailed until such time for execution. God have mercy on us all. Children. 
Sarah, Joseph, Benjamin, and my dear little Hannah. I do not know what will befall them after my sentence is carried out. But, but, but Thomas did give land next to our house to the townspeople as a burial ground. Will they bury my body there, I wonder? Perhaps I can, I can watch after my children with the house so close by. I have tried to live a godly life. We are Puritans. We are guided by the strict code of God's word and the teachings of the church. We are not allowed to dance. We are not allowed to sing unless told to do so during worship. We do not celebrate pagan holidays such as Christmas tide. We are not allowed to miss worship. Many of those around me have broken these rules and they've suffered the punishments, the whippings, or the stocks. But not all people in our community believe as we do. There was a Dutch family in, in Pequot Plantation and, and they enjoyed a meal and a glass of sack at Christmas time. And, and another who liked to dance and, and they felt free to do so. Now, our church stands but a few houses down from our home. The Reverend Hooker is our, our leader, our guide, and our judge. Many people are not holy enough to belong to the church, and the Reverend Hooker exhorts us to try harder to lead an exalted life. I was not holy enough. The church denied me membership. But I have tried to be dutiful in the eyes of the church. I brought that witch, that good wife Bailey, to the courts to answer for her witchery. And I told her and Master Willis what I knew about her. She's filthy, deceitful, sinful woman. But now Master Willis says that I am a witch. She deserves to hang, not me. I was there when they put Nicholas and Margaret to the water test. Oh, that cold water. Margaret, she fears the water so. As proof of their unnatural character, the water was to reject them. But <laughs> the water did deserve those magistrates. And Nicholas and Margaret bobbed part in and part out. They did escape with their lives, but they left the colony in great fear. I do miss them. Why did Rebecca name me as a witch? I never did dance with her in the woods. But any woman, any woman who will give up her husband is a sinner. She never cared for him, Nathaniel. Her third husband. That woman is mad. Master Willis and Reverend Hooker. They say that I am a witch, having lived a life of wickedness and sin. They say that my sinfulness and the sinfulness of others have brought disaster and pestilence to the town. Perhaps they are right. Perhaps God are you angry? For two years, awful illness has taken young and old. 
The crops have failed for two growing seasons. Floods just last year overcame the crops, killing everything. Floods like in the Bible. God, are you trying to rid this earth of human pride and wickedness? I never did entertain the devil. Although after so many days alone in this cold room, I must wonder. Perhaps he has been at work in me. I have had unchristian thoughts. I have committed unchristian acts. I have been impatient with my neighbors and my children. Perhaps he is at work in me. No one, no one spoke up for me at my trial, not even Thomas. Oh, oh but he too could be named a witch. He best be careful. We have four children to care for, so. I do not hold it against him. Soon, my jailers will come for me. They will put me in a cart and Take me to Gallows Hill, where I will hang alongside the greensmiths. Will my children be there? Will this be the last time I will see them? Oh, I hope they are not forever branded the offspring of a witch. century history of Connecticut. Much of what we know about Barnes and the witchcraft trials comes from the original transcripts of trials in the court record of the colony of Connecticut and New Haven. Mary Barnes remains an elusive figure. What you have witnessed here gathers together all the facts as we know them in order to create a, a relationship with of the people she knew. But facts do not tell a person's story in totality. The nuances of one's life cannot be captured in the written record. Does this play represent the spirit of Mary Barnes and her fate? In that, we ask you to be the judge. And now, if you'd please welcome the good people who have brought the Mary Barnes story to life. show your appreciation to the members of the audience who acted as witnesses and members of the court. Stand up, those people. Where are you? One back there. This is Nicky. You're back there. I saw you. Thank you so much for 
joining us this afternoon. We can now break for a little question and answer. You might have a few questions. We have our playwright, our producer, uh, Lisa Johnson, who we all know from her wonderful years at Stanley Whitman House. Our director, Candy Carl. such a delight and a joy to watch the story come to life, um, given color and momentum by Candy Carl, our director, and such life and dedication by these actors. They're just magnificent. Thank you for being here. We're going to have a little question and answer. I'm sure you have lots of questions. Uh, Carol. So can you tell us about the journey of deciding to do this story? Carol Evans, um, another witchcraft researcher uh, here in Connecticut. Um, asked the personal journey behind bringing the story of uh, Mary Barnes to life. And so it really began um, in the year 2000. I'd been director at Stanley Whitman for two years, and I was doing my research about Farmington, and in the classic Farmington in Connecticut book, which is the Bible of Farmington History by Chris Bickford, published by the Farmington Historical Society, was this statement. Um, Farmington was involved in the Greater Witchcraft Panic of 1663. Mary Barnes of Farmington was executed. She had run with a bad crowd. <laughs> There's a great story there. So here we are, what, 10, 14 years later, after many people, including myself, have done research. Um, and we, I decided really over 10 years ago to do a play so that the story of Mary Barnes and the witchcraft trials in Connecticut were brought to a wider audience. So here you are. Thank you, Joe. Yes, Bruce. What do you know about the motivations of the people who accused her? Amen. <laughs> what do we know about the motivations of the people who accused her? Um, I have to watch, I have to watch <laughs> out for the people behind me. Um, <laughs> We don't know a lot, and what you see in this play are really good, educated guesses based on research. The only thing we have about Mary uh, Barnes and her accusation um, and her execution is the one, her indictment in the court records, and that's all we have. We don't have any uh, written testimony from witnesses. We have nothing else. So uh, when the narrator said she is an elusive figure, she is an elusive figure. The relationship tree that was built through research really is the only way we have to try to figure out who are the key players in her accusation. I will say within a week she was tried and executed. That would indicate that the evidence against her was indisputable, which would indicate that the Reverend Hooker had something to do with it. <laughs> but, but we don't know for sure. <laughs> um, yes? Where, if at all, was she buried? So where, if at all, was she buried? Um, so the um, victims of the witchcraft trials were not buried. We assume their bodies were disposed of. Um, they would have been excluded from the community in life and in death, and so they would not have been buried in a community graveyard at all. The idea was to erase, to erase the memory of them. Uh, yes? What happened to her husband and children? Good question. Yes. <laughs> what happened to her husband and children? Do we have any Barnes descendants in the audience? We often will have a descendant. Before Lisa goes on, are there any descendants? Yes. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so Robert Laughlin, uh, the judge, has done a lot of research on many families in, uh, in, in the greater Hartford area. I do genealogy. Just genealogy. Yeah. So uh, Thomas remarried within three months of Mary's execution, which was not uncommon. He had a prenuptial ag agreement with uh, Mary Andrews' father. Mary Andrews lived here in Farmington. She was young. That was not unusual. You wanted to marry pretty quickly if you had children so that the household would continue. Um, one of his sons went on to found what we now know as Bristol. The other son went on to found uh, what we now know <coughs> as Southington. The older daughter, Sarah, married and moved to Waterbury. And Hannah, the youngest, who would have been five, 
at the time of her mother's execution disappears from the record, so we assume that she died before marriageable age. Uh, but Thomas lives to a ripe old age. He gives more land to increase the size of the cemetery here in Farmington, Memento Mori, and um, finishes out his life uh, living a good life and dying a peaceful death. Yes, Jay. Why, why wouldn't Thomas Barnes have testified in, in, on behalf of Mary Barnes? So why wouldn't Thomas Barnes have testified on behalf of uh, Mary there is, Barnes? Yeah. I can take that one. There's a, there's a, yeah. Aside from the context that we can put these rather dastardly seeming characters into for the course of this play, there is um, there is a line in the play that the narrator speaks about Increase Mather, and it is that Increase Mather, who was the president of Harvard, although he didn't do much within that office during that time, his singular marker for recognizing a witch was prior acquaintances with witches. Well, now, a husband and wife may have been acquainted at that time, <laughs> even at that point in time. <laughs> And so with that knowledge and with the shared knowledge of the Barnes family and the Greensmiths and their interactions with the Baileys, knowledge of that through nothing more than the written testimonies and accusations that had come before Increase Mather, he would have in his position as a highly pious and pioneering Puritan at that point in time, uh, Increase was Cotton Mather's father, uh, who himself planted a number of wives before his demise. <laughs> um, his, his demeanor was such that he was looking for witches. He was looking for opportunities to build the knowledge of witchcraft. And who knows? Maybe he wanted to sell some of his books, you know, <laughs> in, a, in a sort of a, a colonial <coughs> style. Uh, self-promotion, but religious leaders at that time within the Puritan church were very, very strict, uh, as we heard, because only one-third of the, the populace was ever admitted to membership, not only here in Farmington, but across New England. Um, they were not a fun bunch to be around. <laughs> and, and, you know, we are here at, at, at a church and in a, in a church property where we can consecrate weddings or hangings, and you know, we ought to have a lot of fun, regardless of which one it is. <laughs> there, was a, there was a pervasive sense of gloom in the entire society that led to Puritan elders trying to build witchcraft cases. So Thomas would very likely not have spoken up on Mary's behalf for fear that he be accused as well. <laughs> oh, you got that subtle message. <laughs> I mean, so it's the politic, the comparison between Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, and, and thank you for comparing that to this, um, and this play, Miller writing during the Red Scare, he was making a statement. Is there some kind of statement we're making with this? I wrote this play in 2004. Um, I would say that the themes in this play, and then I'm going to open it up to the, our, our director, I would say the themes of this play are universal and timeless. Mm -hmm. Candy, what do you think? Yeah, one of the things that really struck me, because I had read it before, but this time around, it was a totally different viewpoint for me. Because the, the reason we really need to pay attention to history so we don't repeat it. When people ask me why history and these stories are so important, it's so we don't repeat them. And it's really putting up a mirror to what we're going through now that some people may have forgotten their history or didn't pay attention to it the first time around. And I think that's what Arthur Miller was doing and some other people were doing. Did she write this to make a political statement? Not necessarily, it's just a really great story about uh, something that happened here. 
But as in all art, there is that reflection and it came back around in 2018 and it absolutely, in my opinion, does reflect what we're going through now. And the, the, the fear and the pointing fingers and I'm better than you and you are less than and all of those, all of those things that are hot topics right now, we're talking 1663. And here we are, we're still going through them. Now obviously not quite so <laughs> intense, uh, but yes, it, in my opinion, it was most definitely a reflection of our political times now, although that wasn't what it was originally meant to be. I wanted to ask you if she thinks that uh, Mary Barnes had anything to do with the house burning now. No. <laughs> Anybody hear that? Did uh, Mary Barnes have something to do with her house burning down yeah, just a few years ago? Take it, Jenny. Well, uh, who am I to speak for Mary Barnes, but <laughs> restless souls. <laughs> All right, fine, I did. <laughs> Judging for my trouble lighting the candle, I'm not so sure. <laughs> you will have no idea how much trouble I've had just since I agreed to come back and do this role, and I think it was Mary Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> the car broke down, it goes on. Yes. It's Mary Barnes. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, we, we also, okay. yeah. Well, we want to thank the Historical Society for having us, and I know B yes. Stockwell is, is ready to, we didn't let her talk before the show. We wanted you all to enter a very tense courtroom, so now, <laughs> it's not safe. I just want to thank these people for what they've done. It just is <laughs> To be specific, I want to thank the Stanley Whitman House for sharing their play with us. And Lisa, <laughs> and Lisa Johnson, who wrote it, Ginny Wolf, who thought of this whole drama series, uh, Candy, who directed it, the actors who acted in it, the Farmington Historical Society, who sponsored it, Jean Pickens, who made the tickets, <laughs> and Newbury, who kept track of the tickets, <laughs> Joanne Lawson, who typed the patron list and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed the mailings, <laughs> And Susan Rohrbach, who created the program and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed. <laughs> and Cindy Caginello, who was the graphic artist in our invitations. And Heather Kelsey, who has organized a terrific wine and hors d'oeuvre reception for you. So please participate. But mostly, I want to thank the audience, you people, who bothered to come out and hear our story. And I think the lesson of the day is, judge not that ye be judged. expansion plan that we're doing. As you all know that all the events that we have been doing have been benefiting our expansion plan which included the purchase of the Elijah Lewis House number one Mountain Spring Road which we have we have raised all the funds for that house and we will be exercising our options tomorrow. Thank you very much. And now we go on to 
through the Phineas Lewis because we, you know we have that. If you don't know, we have that uh, house in storage. That, uh, it's a 1799 ish uh, post and beam house that we were given. And that hopefully will go on the property of the Elijah Lewis house and where the Parsons lot is being built. So we're saving two historic Judah Woodruff homes, which are phenomenal. And that's with you. That's with everyone. And my board members that are all here, I hope you don't mind, but could you stand up one second? Our board members, please. There is a house in Farmington that, another house that is at risk, that is not in the historic district, that uh, an application was just put in to tear it down. It's at the corner of uh, one Waterville, well, Waterville Road in Farmington Avenue. This is a 1600s, it's about that era house. So we have two people here that will be willing to answer questions and have, Betty Koykendall, our town historian, who is right here, who has done an incredible job of helping us raise money, and Paul Kramer. They know the history backward, backwards and, and forwards, and so does Lisa Johnson. Betty has a petition if you feel the need to want to say something personally about this, and they will also be in the back and all around. So if you have questions, please go to them. All right, so thank you very much for coming.